It's time for another edition of Lewis at Large, 60 minutes of smart talk radio featuring guests from all walks of life in conversation with your host, Warner Lewis. So sit back and lend us your ears for the next hour. Now here with today's first guest is the host of Lewis at Large, Warner Lewis. Well, welcome everybody to another segment of Lewis at Large. Yours truly, Warner Lewis, of course, once again. Uh, from the flight deck, and that means some smart talk radios in your future, and uh, very pleased to have uh, this segment with us, uh, Jerry Nelson. There are a lot of Jerry Nelsons in this world, but there's only one uh, that has penned a new work called Dear County Agent Guy. And who is Jerry Nelson? Here's who Jerry Nelson is. He was a freelance writer and former dairy farmer. That'll be an interesting transition right there. He's been published uh, in the nation's top farm publications, including Successful Farming, Progressive Farmer, and Living the Country Life for nearly 20 years. He penned as a weekly newspaper column called Dear County Agent Guy. His column reaches almost a quarter of a million people every single week. Uh, he also course has a website agriculture or the successful farming also posts his column on their website of agriculture.com uh he has left the family uh farming business in 2002 took a position as a writer ad salesman for the dairy star bi-monthly newspaper uh he and his wife julie live in volga south dakota uh, many of our listeners i'm sure have been there we'll find out more jerry how are you my friend I'm excellent. How about you? Well, we're good down here. Uh, to us, you're up north. But uh, anyway, how is the weather up there? It's beautiful. It's 72 degrees and kind of breezy. And uh, we have a son who lives in Kansas City. Well, that's good. That uh, You get down here to see him? Yeah, actually, we were down there a few weeks ago. He got married a year ago, and so we were down to see him and his wife. And uh, we took in a Royals game, and the Royals lost, but it was still a lot of fun. Well, uh, glad to know that. Uh, you can appreciate then uh, what we do down here. Uh, Jerry, let me ask you a question. Uh, you farmed the the family farm uh, for quite a while. How did how did writing come up? Well, it, it came up because of a, a wet year that we had in about 1996. Uh, it was extremely wet, and the there's nothing a person can do about wet weather except look at the water. And one day I drove out and looked at my fields, and uh, it had been so wet for so long that I could see cattails growing where there should have been rows of corn. So I fired up my computer and figured out how to use the word processor and wrote a spoof letter to Mel Kloster, my county extension agent, and asked him if he didn't know of a cheap, effective herbicide to control the cattails in my corn. And while he was at it, maybe he could give me advice on how to get rid of the power boats and jet skis that were out there. They were probably wrecking some corn, too. And uh, Mel thought that the letter was pretty entertaining and recommended that I get it published somewhere. And my reaction was, no, you got to be kidding. I, I have no experience or training as a writer. Uh, but I eventually followed his advice and uh, took the letter to uh, Chris Schumacher, who owned the Volga Tribune, uh, the little local weekly newspaper. And Chris said, yeah, I'll publish this. Do you have any more ideas? And I said, I don't know, maybe one or two. And he said, well, keep them coming. And what should we call this thing? And I said, I don't know. I've never done this before. And he, he said, what's wrong with the letter's salutation? Dear County Agent Guy. And I said, fine. And that's all the thought that went into that. And that launched my writing career. I've been doing a column every week ever since. <laughs> well, that's kind of what we – we uh, uh, interesting indeed uh, – you know, let's let's uh, do get serious for just a second here, if we can get serious about Deer County Agent Guy. Um, share with us, if you would, Jerry, again, agriculture has been your life for uh, many, many decades. And I'm curious now, as you survey the landscape of American agriculture, the American farm, uh, and the American farmer's relationship uh, and the family farm, what is the future uh, from where you sit of the family farm in America? Well, there's still a good number of family farms out there. You know, I work for the Dairy Star, and I get to uh, talk to dairy farmers every week and do stories about them. So I still see a, a good number of family farms out there. And, yeah, I know, especially in the crop farming side, the trend is towards fewer and larger, and the same is true of dairy. But there are, still remains a, a good, solid cadre of smaller dairy farms out there. And and I think what's encouraging is there was a USDA survey a couple of years ago, and the the uh, the number of small farms were actually on the increase. And uh, these are young people that are making the choice to move out to the country and, like, run an organic dairy or 
farm vegetables, and I think that's kind of neat to see that. And uh, they're raising heirloom tomatoes and kind of taking us back to the old days, you know, back when heirloom tomatoes were simply tomatoes. Do you, what about, uh, do you see uh, kids that were raised uh, in an agriculture community and in some of the family farms there, do they go away to school for secondary education and then return, or do they tend to stay? Uh, yeah, I, I think, well, my youngest son had several friends that did exactly that. They got their secondary education and then came back to the farm. And they bring with them all of this knowledge and experience and Farming anymore is a real technical thing. Uh, computers in your tractors with the GPS and everything like that, it, it's, it's like running the space shuttle. And you have to know how to do all these things and use the technology correctly. And, and I think these kids are probably better businessmen than somebody who, like me, simply grew up on the farm and said, this is what I want to do. Uh, they learn how to run the farm like a business instead of something that where I did it basically by the seat of my pants and probably didn't make some of the best decisions. Uh, but, yeah, I, I see a lot of young guys that are getting involved in farming. When you were putting this work together, again, we're talking to Jerry Nelson, uh, family farmer, uh, but now a writer and uh, a good one indeed, a fun book called Deer County Agent Guy, Cap Pulling, Husband Training, and Other Curious Dispatches from a Midwestern Dairy Farmer. Uh, brand new work out here. Uh, Jerry, uh, when you were putting some of these writings together uh, and you look back, was it tough to pick the ones out or were, were they obvious the ones you wanted to include? Well, yeah, um, the folks at Workman said, send us a lot of stuff, even if you don't think it's very good. And uh, uh, I was surprised at some of the things that they thought were good. Um, but, yeah, it's kind of like trying to choose your favorite child. Uh, I, you know, people ask me, what's your favorite writing? And it's, it's always the last one that I did. The, my latest one is my favorite. Uh, but, yeah, I, there was a selection process, and... Uh, I don't know, I forget what all I sent, but it seems to me that Workman accepted a lot of them, and I'm very happy with what they did and very proud of the book. How about uh, encouragement from the family? Tell us about the support or ideas, maybe, yeah, you got from your other half. Yeah, my wife uh, is a saint. Uh, she should be given a medal of some kind for putting up with me for all these years. Um, yeah, she has been nothing but encouraging. She's my uh, first reader of everything that I write, uh, my editor, she will make suggestions, uh, tell me that sometimes that, no, that's stupid, and then she's right, you know, very often she's right that uh, I should change this and maybe tone it down a little bit or something or pull back. Uh, it, it helps to have a woman's perspective on things because uh, hopefully at least half of my readers are going to be female, and so uh, I don't want to be a little, you know, too tough, you know what I mean? Um yeah, and then my children, our boys, they have been uh, encouraging, too. And even though that they've wound up in, in my columns probably more than they would have liked to, uh, but such it is, such is how it goes. I'm reminded of a piece that old Henry did once where he uh, wound up spying on his children to get material for writing, and uh, they would say to each other, Shh, be quiet, Papa's here, so they wouldn't wind up in the paper. <laughs> Jerry, uh, the, 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 the work that is in here, there are some very, very poignant stories. There are some funny ones uh, all about experience. Did you ever during your career uh, as, as a farmer or as a writer uh, think, gee, it really would be interesting to see what the other half or the urban uh, side of the world is all about to live in a larger community or to do something different? Or was this always your first love? No, farming was always my first love. Uh, I grew up on the land, and uh, on a busy day, a total of six cars will go by the end of my driveway. Um, I can walk 20, 30 feet and be in a cornfield, and right now I can see my neighbor out tilling a field, and this is all I ever wanted. I've, I've visited big cities, and I realize what they're like, and I mean, yeah, they're fun, they're exciting, but they're also very tiring, and uh, I would much rather be here. This is where I belong. There's a chapter in here called The Ghosts of Horses Past, and it talks about uh, one of your least favorite jobs of walking the perimeter fence and yeah. looking for fixes. Tell us a little bit about that. That is something that I think when you drive across American interstates, particularly in the rural areas, and you see fences of all different kinds, and you think, who fixes all that stuff? 
Yeah, the farmers fix them, and and there's no machine that can do it. You have to, you know, get out and walk. And, of course, nowadays they have four-wheelers you can drive along, but we didn't have that back then. So, yeah, one spring uh, before I turned my cattle out into the pasture, we had to walk the perimeter of the fence and fix what had gotten broken during the winter. And, uh, yeah, and we paused out on the hillside, and I remembered uh, my father and I doing the exact same thing before this child by my side was born and my dad telling me a story of, you know, because this farm is where my dad had grown up and uh, how back in the 30s uh, there was a a sickness that went through the horses and would kill them sometimes and they would drag them out to our slough here because that's where the digging was easy and uh, bury horses out there. And you can't tell it now, but like I said to my son, there's a lot of dead horses out there, I guess, and I don't know where they are, but they're out there somewhere, I'm sure. What about, you know, we were talking earlier uh, in this interview a little bit about your wife. Uh, there's there's a fun story in there, interesting, about about your courtship and, and your wedding night. Share with that, if you would. Yeah, well, this is all pretty much true. Uh, I met my wife uh, one evening when uh, I was in Brookings. I was a Norwegian bachelor farmer, and I was kind of lonely, so I was in Brookings, and I was walking down the street. And I happened to bump into this gal that I knew. Her name was Rosie. And I said, Rosie, how's it going? Let's duck into this place and have us a refreshment. So we sat down and ordered something cold to drink. And Rosie turned to me and she said, you know what? i got to visit the ladies' room. And I said, I'll keep the chair warm for you. And Rosie got up and left, and I haven't seen her since. And I don't think she's coming back. Uh, But on my way out, I stopped and talked to the nice little waitress, and that turned out a little better because we've been married for 35 years now and have two sons. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, then on our wedding night, when my wife and I got married, uh, we uh, you know had the ceremony and had a little dance, and then we were heading back to our place, and the idea was that we were going to quick uh, change clothes and grab a couple bags and then leave on a honeymoon. And as we're driving down that long driveway, and this is about midnight, there are these blue-green reflectors bouncing around out there, and uh, it was my cows. They had decided to break out of their pen on our wedding night. So I stopped the car and I turned to my bride and I said, okay, here's how we should do things. You get out and you open the gate and then when the cows come your way, I'll chase the cows your way, you flap your wedding dress and scare them into the pen. And she looked at her dress and she looked at me and she said, you've got to be kidding. And she walked into the house and that's kind of how it's gone ever since. What about Jerry? How important was it to you and your wife? Uh, I know everyone has a goal of raising uh, good and proper, so to speak, kids. But mm-hmm. was it important to you uh, that those kids be a part uh, and carry on the family business, so to speak, or did you encourage them to go away and see the world? I think it's important for every young uh, person to get an education, and that's what we uh, put into our kids from very early on, that you need to go to college. Even if you just go one year, you need to try it at least and see if this is something you should do. And so both of our sons went to college, and uh, they, they're they both uh, very smart, and they both now have very good careers, and we're extremely proud of both of them. But I think we can take a little bit of credit for giving them a good work ethic by raising them on a dairy farm. They, they learned how to work, and uh, they have very strong work ethic. Do you – there's a tremendous – move, as you know, over the last several years in particular towards uh, sort of local sustainable food and then shortening that food chain from farm to farm to plate. I'm I'm sure you've heard quite a bit about that. And I'm curious, do you believe that that the American farm is truly closer, not only culturally, but maybe even sort of spiritually connected more to their city counterparts? Or are those, those groups still running in totally opposite worlds? Well, even here in South Dakota, which is a very rural state, uh, we have people that have very few ideas about where their food comes from. But, yeah, we have uh, seen that local uh, food type thing here, and uh, I think it's a good and valuable thing, and I hope it continues. Um, We have a local young man here who has a dairy farm, and he also has a a vegetable garden, and they sell at farmer's markets, uh, and uh, he and his wife and their four children are are seem to be doing very well, and I think 
it's those kinds of things that can, uh, this thinking outside of the box can keep the smaller operations going, I think. What, uh, I mean, I'm sure just things in daily life gave you inspiration uh, for more columns for Deer County Agent Guy, but give us an example. Would you wake up in the morning with an idea, or did sometimes you just, wait, so to speak, led your life and things came along and you jumped on a typewriter or a computer? Mostly it's the latter. Mostly I was leading my life and things would happen, and I'd be like, oh, okay, there we go. we got to write about that. Um, very seldom do I have more than one idea in my head. It's usually there's a, a last-minute panic, uh, a deadline is looming, and I'm like, oh, boy, what am I going to write about? And uh, I very often turn to my wife and say, what do you think? And she'll say, well, how about, and, you yeah, we'll get an idea and then just go from there. And uh, it's it's worked so far. It's worked for 20 years, so I guess I'll keep on. One of the chapters is called My Shameful Affair with the Farm Program. Tell us uh, a little bit about that. That should be an interesting one. Yeah, uh, farmers are interesting. You know, we uh, are anti-government, but we also know that government checks never bounce. Um, yeah, I. Uh, this is back uh, during the 1980s. There was this thing called the PIC certificates that were issued. It was called Payment in Kind, and they were basically the same as uh, getting X many bushels of grain. And so there were all these weird things that were happening. These PIC certificates took on a value of their own. And and uh, you could – I wound up owning grain in a town like a 100 and some miles away that I didn't even know about. But that's some of the strange things that happened. And it's it, uh, I call it my shameful affairs because, like I say, farmers are generally, oh, we can do it all ourselves. But – like I said, we also know that government checks never bounce, so we we always take that check if we can get it. What about uh, again Ed, when you uh, when you would write a column? Tell us a little bit about the editing process, and by that I mean you had an idea, you probably did a rough draft or two, changed it around a little bit. Did anyone else see it uh, before it was published uh, in ter- in terms of your family, or did you have some people inside the house there that also gave you some uh, critiques? Usually just my wife, and I, I tell people that writing is, is 10% inspiration and 90% editing. Um, I'll get an idea, and um, people talk about writer's block, and I'm familiar with the concept. And basically writer's block is just the unwillingness to put crap up on the screen. But that's what you got to do is free yourself to just put any stupid idea up there. And then it, for me anyway, it helps to let it ferment a little while. And I come back and look at it, and I say, okay, this is an idea here, and there's another one there, but maybe we can connect them, and and that's kind of how it works. And, uh, yeah, the only person who generally uh, sees it before it gets published is my wife. Uh, I'll read it aloud to her. And that's the acid test. If you read it aloud and it sounds good, it usually is good. What about, let's, uh, I want to steer away from the book for just a second here, get your opinion on the whole concept of corporate farming, so to speak, uh, versus the family farm or a smaller operation. From where you sit, uh, and again, in your many decades in this particular career, what is the value uh, of corporate farming or advantages, so to speak? And then what are some of what you see maybe are the negative things it brings to the table? Well, uh, some of the negative things that I've heard, I haven't experienced them myself, is that, uh, like, say, a large farm will come in and they'll bring in inputs from far away and they won't purchase them locally because they've made a deal and they've got this buying power uh, that they can exercise that maybe the smaller guys don't have. Uh, But the smaller operations, uh, like in dairy especially, they have advantages too because they can control their costs a little better and – they have worked the land and have a closer relationship to it, I think. Um, I really don't have anything against corporate farming per se. Uh, I mean, I when I was a kid, I remember a guy looking at a John Deere 4020 going down pulling a five-bottom plow, and he said they should have never made a tractor bigger than an M Farmall because uh, that will wreck the country because these big tractors can farm. Well, now tractors have 750 horsepower. Um it's just the way it is, uh, the way of the world. 
What about, uh, we kind of start to wind down here, Jerry, and again, we're with Jerry Nelson. He's a columnist for the Dairy Star for many years, a dairy farmer himself, uh, penned a column uh, for a multitude uh, of distribution channels and a brand new work called Deer County Agent Guy. Jerry, is there one particular story uh, or a couple uh, in the book that that really, and you feel, encapsulate not only sort of your special writing style, but also your career as a farmer? Well, if you want to go to the very beginning of the book and also my career as a farmer, the one about uh, the baby chick, where my sister and I uh, were given a baby chick when I was perhaps four years old and she was about six, and we decided that we would raise that chick in the house and it would patrol for crumbs and uh, perhaps lay eggs for us and we didn't know what to do with it uh, at night so we let it occupy the space between us in the bed and then in the morning the chick was gone and well it was underneath my sister and it was very flat and very deceased and uh, and at the other end of the spectrum and it's kind of one of the more serious or poignant ones is at the end of the book it's called The Four Seasons of Farming and and I like that one because uh, it takes you through all four seasons of farming, and you feel the deep rhythms of the land and and my connection with it, and the sights and the sounds and the smells. I, I hope anyway that the reader uh, can read that and just feel a little bit of what I experience out here on the prairies of South Dakota. Well, again, the work is called Deer County Agent Guy, Cap Bowling, Husband Training, and Other Curious Dispatches from a Midwestern Dairy Farmer, a uh, good guy, Jerry Nelson, columnist for the Dairy Star. Hey, uh, Jerry, uh, two things. A, how can people get a copy of the work? And also uh, check out some of the, the regular writings that you're continuing to do. Well, it can be purchased at Workman.com or Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Any major bookseller will have it. Uh, check out your local bookseller, too. And my column is carried regularly on uh, agriculture.com, Successful Farming's website, so you can see it every there. I post it every Monday. Well, Jerry, uh, I know you've done a bunch of these interviews. We do appreciate uh, you being a part of uh, this show. And uh, best of luck to you from one agrarian state to another. Uh, hope to have you back on again in the future. You bet. Thank you so much. You bet. We'll be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large.